In the previous video, we discussed the reasons why we select some information over other information. However, this leaves another question. What happens to all that information that we don't attend to? In this video, we'll discuss some theories that address when and how much information is filtered on its journey to consciousness. Let's first explore some phenomena that form the empirical basis for the theories to be discussed in this video, beginning with the cocktail party effect, moving on to in inattentional blindness, and finally change blindness. Imagine you're at a restaurant with some friends. It's a noisy restaurant with lots of people talking and music playing in the background. You're listening to your friends, and despite all the competing sounds, you somehow manage to hear and understand what your friends are saying. Voices from the table next to you are clearly audible, but what their conversation is, you would be unlikely to say. Now imagine someone in that other table suddenly saying your name. You notice this right away, and your attention shifts from the conversation at your table to the conversation at the other table. This situation is known as the cocktail party effect, and it raises two questions. One, how were you able to block out all that noise while understanding what your friends were saying? And two, how were you able to then recognize your own name being mentioned at the other table when you have no recollection of anything that was said leading up to the, your name? In other words, what was your mind doing with that conversation at the other table that allowed you to hear your name in the first place? Such a phenomenon has been studied by cognitive scientists using what is called the dichotic listening task. This task re requires participants to wear headphones in which separate messages arrive in each ear. The participants are instructed to listen or shadow the message in one ear or what is called the attended channel, and to ignore the message in the other ear, or what is called the unattended channel. A research question arising out of this methodology includes what kind of information is processed in the unattended channel. Let's turn to a second example, inattentional blindness, or what is sometimes called perceptual blindness. This is when an individual fails to perceive some object or event that is fully identifiable, readily recognized, but its appearance was unexpected. Such a situation has nothing to do with deficits in vision, but rather it's a quite ordinary experience. Inattentional blindness can be quite dangerous when driving, such as when a person unexpectedly begins jaywalking and you fail to notice this. Despite looking where you're driving and having that person clearly within your field of vision, uh, you have run the risk of getting into an accident. The likelihood of inattentional blindness can increase when you're distracted, such as using a cell phone, even if it's hands-free and you continue to look at the road. Perhaps the most famous experiment associated with inattentional blindness is the invisible gorilla. In this study, participants are asked to Observe a group of people standing in a circle, some wearing white shirts, others wearing black shirts, while they pass a ball around. The participants are asked to count the number of passes made among all those wearing white shirts. While doing this task, a person dressed in a gorilla outfit conspicuously walks through the center of the circle, stops, does a little dance, and then leaves. The participants counting the passes are later asked if they noticed anything unusual while counting the number of passes among the uh, players wearing the white shirts. Around 50% of participants did not report seeing the gorilla. And this raises a question. How is it possible that something so obvious could be missed by so many people? Let's turn to a third and final example. 
change blindness. Change blindness, like inattentional blindness, involves missing some fairly obvious information. However, rather than missing an unexpected stimulus, in change blindness, there is an unnoticed change in a stimulus that you are consciously perceiving. The most well-known study demonstrating change blindness involves a researcher pretending to be someone lost on campus and approaches a pedestrian to ask for directions. While the pedestrian, who's actually an unwitting participant, uh, is giving directions, another set of individuals, also secretly researchers, passes between them, temporarily obscuring the pedestrian's vision of the lost individual. At that moment of interruption, the researcher pretending to be lost switches with one of the other individuals uh, who was carrying a very large object that obscured uh, the pedestrian's vision. Once the interruption is over, um, the new person acts as if nothing has changed and continues listening to the directions being given by the pedestrian. The question here is whether the pedestrian would notice that there is a complete change in the person that they're talking to. As with the gorilla study, only about half notice the change. Filter theories propose a mechanism, a filter, that allows some information to pass and removes or inhibits other information from further cognitive processing. Researchers have proposed different points at which this filter occurs. To understand these proposals, it's helpful to keep in mind the information processing approach, which claims that information is processed in a series of discrete cognitive stages, moving from sensory analysis to perceptual pattern analysis to conscious recognition and awareness as that information enters short-term memory. The early selection hypothesis proposes that unattended information is filtered out prior to any perceptual pattern analysis and so never gets passed on to conscious recognition and awareness. This offers one explanation for those three phenomena previously described. When asked for what was heard during the dichotic listening task, participants can only report information received by the attended channel, the one uh, that they were listening to intentionally whereas no meaningful information can be recalled from the unattended channel. This also appears to support the findings associated with inattentional and change blindness. The information we are not attending to gets completely filtered before it has a chance to enter conscious awareness. However, there are findings that contradict this explanation, such as when we suddenly hear our name from a conversation we were not attending to. How is it possible that we could not be processing the meaning of unattended information and yet still have some of that information rise to the level of conscious awareness? Another set of studies using the dichotic listening task altered the experiment. This time in one ear, the participants heard, Dear One Jane, and simultaneously heard in the other ear, Three Aunt Six. Like before, the participants were asked to attend only to one ear. However, rather than report what they heard from the attended ear, um, they were more likely to report hearing Dear Aunt Jane. This finding suggests that something else is going on in the mind that's not accounted for by the early selection hypothesis. Rather, it seems that filtering happens after some of the meaning of incoming information has been unconsciously analyzed, and this would have to be the case in order for any of the information to eventually enter into conscious awareness like it does. The attenuation model attempts to account for these findings. According to this model, information not attended to is weakened or attenuated, but not completely blocked from some degree of perceptual pattern recognition. Unattended information generally will not be processed as the signal is not strong enough to undergo full conscious recognition. However, some of this unattended information may require only a very low signal for it to trigger further processing in the mind. That appears to be the case for words that have a high subjective importance, such as fire, help, or your name. 
other information may have a low recognition threshold because the mind has been recently exposed to it. So it's primed to recognize it again. If you just watched the most recent episode of The Walking Dead, for example, you might be likely to, uh, more likely to register a conversation about that episode happening at the nearby table, even though you weren't intentionally trying to listen on to their conversation. And this is because your mind had been primed to attend to that information. A difficulty with the attenuation model is that it doesn't seem to explain why, in the case of inattentional blindness, we wouldn't notice someone crossing the street while driving, even though such information clearly has strong personal relevance. One possibility has to do with the different perceptual modalities we're dealing with. The examples of inattentional and change blindness provided uh, pertain to the visual system, whereas the examples in support of the attenuation model using the dichotic listening task involve the auditory system. It may be that the early filter hypothesis better explains some aspects of visual attention, while the attenuation model better explains some aspects of auditory attention. As is the case for many of the ideas presented in, in this series, the answers are never quite as simple as they seem. The final explanation related to filter theories is the late selection hypothesis. It proposes that all incoming information undergoes complete, unattenuated perceptual pattern analysis, and the filter does not occur until right before that information could enter conscious awareness, whereby it can then be responded to. Supporting this theory are priming studies that demonstrate how information unattended to can still influence our behaviors, such as the word chosen for a STEM completion task. Someone exposed to certain words in the unattended channel, who later is asked to finish words when prompted with a few letters, are more likely to complete the task using words presented from that unattended channel even though the participant does not recall having heard those words during the dichotic listening task. Other studies exploring subliminal processing have suggested the possibility that such information influences other kinds of decision-making and behavior, such as consumer purchasing or eliciting certain kinds of emotions. The findings here are very controversial, but if correct, they would suggest the late selection hypothesis is correct because in order for such information to affect us, its meaning would have to be processed at some level. We've addressed three different kinds of filter theories, but there is a, an entirely different approach that describes attention not in terms of selection, but rather as capacity. Capacity theories present attention as a limited capacity system that can be distributed among a limited number of stimuli at any given time. When someone is engaging in a particularly demanding task, requiring a great deal of concentration, very few mental resources remain left over for processing any other kind of information. Such an approach may help to explain some of the contradictory conclusions found in the early uh, and late selection models. For tasks with high cognitive load that greatly demand mental resources, there may be very little to no information that gets processed outside of those tasks. However, if you are engaging in a relatively simple task, then more attentional resources can be allocated to other information in your environment, even if you're not actively attending to it. Listening to words and repeating them, as in the dichotic listening task, can be a relatively less cognitively demanding task, so allow for other kinds of personally relevant information to enter consciousness. In contrast, engaging in a conversation demands a great deal of cognitive resources, and so the individual may be susceptible to inattentional or change blindness. As such, filter and capacity theories may complement one another. Filters may be early, may be attenuated, or filter information late depending upon how much mental resources are being used at that given moment. An important practical implication arising from these theories is the need to pay attention to attention. If indeed attention is a limited resource 
and we're susceptible to missing important information when our attention is being used up, we better make sure that we're spending that resource wisely. So now I'll ask you, did you notice that I'm wearing a different shirt now than at the beginning of this video? If not, you were just susceptible to change blindness. Please feel free to like this video and uh, subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.